Hi there. If you are new here, be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the bell so you don't miss a video. My name is Myrna and I'm a licensed wildlife rehabilitator for the state of Connecticut. Like so many of us, it's my regular job that pays the bills and all of the work I do to save wildlife is completely voluntary. With my busy lifestyle, filming and sharing what I know is a labor of love and I'm honestly not perfect. So if you have helpful information um, or a tip from experience that you would like to share, please do so in the comments below so we can all learn and grow with this profession. These videos are not intended to replace the need for a mentor who will sit with you in person and show you how to safely feed and care for wild animal babies. For your safety and for the well-being of the animals you intend to save, please do this work legally and never stop learning. With all of that said, let's get into the video. So let's talk about the actual transport and intake. So you have all your supplies, you're ready to do this thing. Let's say you start getting calls and texts and all that stuff. So prior to arriver, arrival, wow, can't talk. You always want to ask the finder, and I'm going to call them finders because um, so we're not going to give any names here. So you're always going to ask the finder, call or text, questions like eyes open or eyes closed, right? We're talking about mammals, marsupials, and specifically here we're talking about mice. So we need to know these things. I need to know um, what the eyes are, are doing. Are they open or closed? And the next thing I need to know is... Um, are they warm or cold to the touch? You always want to keep them warm, but it's important to know these things because this information is going to help you understand whether or not they are a good candidate for um, reuniting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, once they arrive, so on return, uh, arrival or return, assessing the condition and record keeping. Record keeping is a big, big thing, you guys. Um, I know when we get busy, we fall behind on the paperwork, but it's really going to benefit you to stay on top of that. You're going to ask the finder to fill out the intake form. These records are mostly for you, but every year you have to file and say how many animals you got, how many were you know, uh, hit by a car, how many were cat caught, how many were, like, they're going to ask you a lot of things that you're just going to forget by the end of the year, so you need to have a record. Your intake file should also let people know if you are a volunteer and how they can donate. Um, I can give you an example of what mine looks like, so you can um, get a feel for um, what it can be, but mine isn't the poster child of what it should be. It's just an example. So here on the screen is um, one of my many forms. I've had many throughout the years and I've changed them as I went and I'm sure you will too. This may or may not work for you, but generally speaking, I need to know the intake, you know, what I'm bringing in. And I have all these easy for them to fill out, just circle what applies. With the species, um, I tend to circle this ahead of time for them so I already know, and I put the number or the count of how many, so circling mice here, and I'll say four or six or one, however many mice I was getting. The patient circumstances, so this is going to help you remember later uh, all that stuff that the state wants to know, you know, um, and also did you have to overwinter this one, meaning did you get them towards the end of the season and miss that window of opportunity to release into the wild before winter, then you have to overwinter. You have to hold on to them until spring. Uh, also, if they were released or if they had to be euthanized. Patient condition, um, it's always going to be dehydrated, <laughs> but uh, mainly you wanna know, remember if you had to do any vet care um, and depending on you know how much that costs you at the end of the year, this will also help you um, know if you need more donations or what you need to ask for with that donation. Um, if you can keep a record of what you pay for your vet care. Location found. So I have here location will be used if releasable. We're found. This location found can also help you um, if you want to send out um, at the end of the year any thank you cards 
for donation or things like that. Mainly I really need the phone number because I like to send text updates on the condition of the animal, especially if they're doing well. I always like to let people know. This last part is um, repeated. So one is for them to keep, the other is for me. So the first one's for me. Uh, date of appointments, so that's really today's date, and it tells them the legal um, part of why I'm doing this. So um, this is something that is set by the state, um, that adequate care will be given, and I need them to sign that they understand this is a voluntary service, so it is not for profit. Um, and then I also have a way for them to donate, so if they want to um, give a donation, this is their, their receipt here where they can say, you know, how much they want to donate and how they want to go ahead and do that. So um, just an example, but you do want to make sure that folks have a way of donating because not everyone carries cash. I know the first time before I was licensed and I encountered um, a bird in the road that needed help and I went to a rehabilitator, um, she only took cash and uh, I had to go to an ATM and bring it to her another day. So make it easy for people that want to help you out and give a donation and offer digital ways of doing so. Okay, so that's the intake form. It's important that you keep good records. Um, also important, while people are filling out the form, this is a great time to inspect the animal for fly eggs, wounds, etc. So while you have them distracted with the form, you, you really need them distracted because as soon as you arrive, people are in shock and they just want to tell you everything in grave detail, which is wonderful. But at the same time, you can't neglect the animal longer of waiting <laughs> to get help. So um, it's best that you uh, try to get them to focus on filling out the form while you quietly on the side uh, take a look at the animal and get your own theory of what's going on. Um, because you'll need to stabilize and you also need to make a decision on how quickly it needs to get to a vet or maybe not at all. So after you've determined that, then it's a good time to let the finder vent about how they feel about it and all those details. Because by then you'll already know, hey, you know, I need to get, I need to get them to a vet right away. Or, no, nope, she's fine, I'm just going to have her warm up in my car while we talk, and then I'll begin stabilizing her after. So you can better uh, decide what to do if you follow these steps in this order. So number three is, you know, you've already had that chat, and you guys are ready to part, and you're going to go home with your passenger. You always want to seatbelt them in. Um, the nest box itself with the tote needs to be seat belted into the passenger seat. Do not put it on the floor. All of these burrowing species are uh, very afraid of vibrations. It's a natural instinct because they live in tunnels to be terrified of earthquakes or anything like that. So their instinct is to run and get out of there. And um, what you don't need is your poor sick animal or your babies just traumatized because they're feeling the vibrations of the engine of your car or the bumps in the road. So it's really best if you put them on the seat where there's at least a large cushion to help with that. Not that you want to be hitting potholes on your way home, but um, even just regular driving on a smooth road, um, feeling the floor of your car, you can feel every little bump sometimes. So uh, don't put them on the floor. Please put them on the seat and seatbelt them in for their safety. I also ask you don't play the radio, um, especially not talk radio. You will scare them to death with strange humans talking, um, but definitely not, not even regular radio. Um, I just play bird sounds. It's just nature bird singing. I have a little SD card that I got just from recordings that are free on the internet and put them together on a, on a little drive and I just pop that into my car. If you're still using an iPod or you know anything like that, just do it that way or burn a CD depending on how old your car is. Mine is not new so <laughs> I had a newer radio put in so I can use the SD. But whatever method you need, um, definitely play nature bird singing sounds 
it tremendously helps, especially if you're a transporter. You really should do this as well. Transporting animals while they're listening to nature sounds um, really does help. And try to pick nature sounds that are for your area. Uh, I like to pick anything that has robins in it, and the American robin, because um, especially when I'm transporting birds, they absolutely love it. It just it sounds like they're outside, and sometimes they sing along and they really enjoy. Uh, hearing it and of course rabbits you know other animals it really does help to keep them calm hearing the sounds of the outside even though they know that they're in an enclosure okay so transport and intake sometimes you shouldn't even take them in or transport them we always want to consider the fact that reuniting is possible um, the vast majority of the calls that I get from the police department are actually reunite cases. These are not animals that actually need help. Um, it's just the general public not understanding the situation and thinking that the animal needs help when they really don't. So kidnapping is um, unfortunately something that happens a lot. And they're all like really caring people that do this. They're not trying to hurt the babies at all, but it can kill them. Uh, being separated from their mother and waiting for help all the while they're starving. Um, and sometimes by the time I get them, it's too late. So we want to make sure that we educate the public first and we first of all determine whether or not they can be reunited. So here I just have an example of uh, some text messages um, that um, I think it was between Messenger and my regular te text message. We were going back and forth, but essentially um, you can see in the photo some healthy little mice babies. These babies are healthy. They're not wrinkly. They're not, they look like little fat babies, like they were well taken care of. And you can even see a little nesting material on them. So this person um, you know, people see them alone, oh, these little babies all by themselves, the poor things, and they immediately take them. Um, and that's just not good at all. Uh, they are fine. Their mom is coming for them. It's just she's a single mom by herself, and she can't always be there. So she leaves her babies alone for an hour or two at a time while she's out running her mousy errands and doing her things. It's very normal for baby mice to be alone. So um, a lot of times by the time they reach me, um, it's been a little while. So we want to make sure these babies are warm and that they're not compromised before we try to reunite them. Babies need to be warm to be reunited with their mom. If they're cold, they need to be warmed up and then put right back where they were found with the nesting material. Mom will smell the human stink on them, but it doesn't mean she will reject them. It just means she will be afraid for their lives and she will move them. And so that's how we know that we're successful. When the person goes back to check in a few hours, not an hour, hours, give her time. She has to move them one by one to a new nest that she had to make. <laughs> so give her time, but one by one, she'll move her babies and they will just seemingly disappear. Um, and that means that mom came smelled you on them and was like, oh no, I got to take them out of here. Someone's going to come back and eat them or do something bad to them. So quick tip knowing that um, if you do have mice that you found maybe in your kitchen that you don't want, just touch their little heads, breathe on them, you know, put your smell on them and mom will be afraid for their lives and she will move them. So you can um, evict them that way. Please don't move babies for mom. She will never find them, and you would have orphaned them for no reason. So you can see here, um, she went and put them back, and the sock was to keep them warm because they were cold by the time she had reached out to me. You can see this is late, late in the day, p.m., um, and she took the babies. So yay, the babies were gone when she went to check on them in the morning. Mice are nocturnal. They do a lot of things at night. So although during the daytime she can still... Uh, take her babies back because they need to be fed during the day. Uh, they have an excellent chance at night. So don't think like with squirrels, you can't do this. Nightfall, that's it. You've lost your chance for that day. With mice, nope, your chances go up because they're even more active at night. 
All right, so adults or weaned juveniles. So we need to talk about um, this category that you will get. It's rare, but they come in for a different reason. So we need to know the location and the behavior. So are they going in circles? If they are going in circles, is it head trauma? Um, I've had, had some head trauma mice um, where they were found in the road going in circles. Eye or ear issue, I have actually found a maggot in an eye um, and that was making them go in circles. They could have an ear infection. That's always a possibility for them to go in circles. Uh, brain parasite, this is unfortunate if this is what they have. It is a going in circles, but it has some key differences. The brain parasite um, is trying to get into the belly of a predator, and so it's just using the mouse as bait. So the behavior will be really strange. Um, they just make the mouse just run and run and run, and especially make it splash in water. It's a really odd behavior. They just won't stay out of their water dish. They just keep splashing because they're trying to make a commotion and entice um, a cat or a bird of prey to eat them um, because of the parasite inside is trying to get into the cat or the, the bird. So if we do find this case, unfortunately we can't save the mouse, but um, I like to try to keep them as comfortable as possible because I don't want the parasite being successful and getting into another animal, um, but unfortunately there's no treatment for this one. Injured arm or leg, um, or even a bot fly, I do have an example of that. So a couple of reasons why just going in circles uh, could be uh, the behavior. If they're lethargic or barely moving, very common with mice is that they're dehydrated. So a lot of people, at least in my area, where I was rehabilitating um, New England, everyone has a basement. And a lot of those older uh, structures, the basement isn't like a concrete wall. It's, it's usually stonework. And so in between the stones, uh, the mice can dig a little hole and then pop out and drop into your open wide basement and have no way to get back out. So they were just digging in the ground, making a tunnel, and then they suddenly uh, end up in your basement. And now they're trapped. So by the time the finder comes across this poor little mouse just sitting there, they're about to do laundry, and here's this little fuzzball in the middle of the, um, the floor, just doing nothing, just sitting there, and the poor thing is so dehydrated. So I have an example of that as well that I will show you a little bit later. Uh, there's always the possibility of poisoning, but it is rare nowadays. Uh, lately, the past few years, people have been more aware that poisoning is bad for a lot of reasons. It doesn't target the, the animal you're targeting. It targets all animals, including your own dogs and cats and children, um, owls, other animals that you don't want to harm. And, and I'm not saying it's okay to poison mice either, but just, just to say that uh, poisoning is a really, really archaic way to go about it. Uh, it's a possibility that you could get a mouse that was poisoned, but like I said, it's very rare nowadays um, that that's the case. Most of them, if they're not dehydrated, they're cat caught. So a lot of people have house cats and the cat caught the little mouse. Um, if they are cat caught, um, they need to go to a vet because the cat saliva, it's a lot like a Komodo dragon bite. The cat saliva has a bacteria in it that will slowly kill them of an infection. So you do need to know if it was in the cat's mouth or if the cat was playing with the mouse. Um, it's gonna need an antibiotic um, if you want him to survive and not die of a massive infection. All right, so for infants, so that was the juveniles and adults that you'll get. You will get infants, of course, you want to know, is it kidnapped? Uh, we want to reunite with their mother. So where did you find them? Eyes closed, alone in a nest? If so, you know, mom mouse does not have to be present. All the babies are sleeping. They're not abandoned. So how do you know if they are abandoned? You know, what if while mom mouse was out running her errands, she got caught by, uh, by a predator and she's not going to be coming home? What if that happened? How do you know? Well, if you look at the babies themselves, they should show signs of being abandoned. So especially if they're skinny, 
If they're wrinkly, I think the wrinkliness is the easiest thing to notice when they start getting really dehydrated. If they're cold, if you touch the babies and they're cold, that is absolutely a sign that uh, mom hasn't come back for a while and they're starting to get cold. She hasn't, um, she hasn't been sitting all fat and fluffy on them um, and warming them up every now and then. They've been sitting alone for a long time. If they're dirty or they have bugs, they are definitely abandoned. Mom mouse would never have dirty babies. Um, mice are very clean animals, just like cats. They groom themselves all the time. And she is grooming her babies every time she feeds them. And when they're little, that's every two hours. These babies are getting licked clean. So if they are dirty, something is very wrong. They've been fending for themselves without a mom for a while. And if they have bugs, which means that the flies have figured out she's not around and they have been laying eggs on them, definitely need to uh, bring them to someone like me and get them help. Um, they should not have fleas, they shouldn't have mites, they should not have fly eggs. And fly eggs um, turn into maggots. They look like tiny little, like tiny white rice smaller than a grain of rice but that's kind of what it looks like and they're usually in clusters and they are the worst in summer because um, they really they really do wreak havoc eyes open so eyes open wandering around alone so this is where it could be trapped in a basement or still nursing but mom mouse hasn't returned and the babies are out looking for her so this can happen uh, I especially know that they have been orphaned if there are eyes open wandering and there's more than one wandering around, I will take them because um, they shouldn't all be out, they're, they're out looking. If there's just one and it's in an environment where they're dehydrated, I think, okay, maybe you just got trapped, it's just the one baby that was exploring, but I still take them in because um, they need to be hydrated. And that's not something you want your finders doing. It's very easy to choke the babies and, and kill them, essentially, with asphyxiation um, and aspirate them. So you want to do that. Don't instruct the finders to do that. So how do they come to you? I get cat-caught animals all the time that need antibiotic right away, so I always have some in my fridge ready to administer. Sometimes we're just dealing with a juvenile that's very thirsty. And that's a pretty quick turnaround. Uh, their biological parent is best. We are primates. We're not mice mothers. We do our best. You know, when there's no choice and their mother is gone or she's dead, um, we will do our best. But at the end of the day, I am not a replacement for mom. I, I, I'm just trying my best to help them. So it is best that they stay with her if she's still alive. Uh, only when reuniting attempts have failed do we consider rehabilitation. So if we've got healthy babies, we got to push, push, push like you need to reunite them and really work with people on doing that. Um, all mammal mothers want their babies uh, because if she didn't want them, she would have abandoned them right after birth, right? They wouldn't exist if she didn't want them. So she's already put in enough work for them to be alive today she wants them tomorrow. She wants them still uh, because they're a lot of work. So uh, she's put in the work. She wants them. So let her have her babies back. We reunite by making sure the babies are warm. We reunite by making sure the babies are right back where they were found. It's okay if they smell like you. She's not going to reject them. She will reject them if they are cold and dying because there isn't a whole lot she can do at that point. If they are warm and healthy, she will absolutely take them back. So she's not a vet herself, um, and she doesn't have all of the resources that I have. She can't give them a sub Q. She, um, she's limited. So we have to make sure that they're in good condition when we reunite them with her. If we're worried that she might not find them, there was one case where they were found inside of a tarp on someone's boat so the tarp had moved and all that so we wanted to put them very close to where they were but because it wasn't exactly where they were I did ask the person to put a little bit of uh, sunflower seeds right where the babies were to ensure that she would smell the food and entice her to look and be like oh okay wow and my babies are right here just to make sure she could find them and she did 
So um, definitely reunite or you will get overwhelmed with healthy babies that really should just be with their mom. All right, so let's talk about some examples, especially if you're new to this, you're probably scared and you're afraid of like, what if people call me and they ask me something I don't know uh, the answer to, it's okay. You don't have to know all the answers. Uh, you always have the right to get back to them with an answer, to let them know, um, check with your mentor. So the tip for this intake example is don't take everything as truth, but as a point of view, okay? Everything is just a point of view. Remember that. So the finder says, I have a baby mouse that was just sitting in the middle of the room, barely moving. So I ask, are the eyes open or closed? Does he or she have fur? Finder says, has fur, eyes closed. Okay, can you send me a photo? So think about this, has fur, which means we're not talking about pinkies, okay? We're not talking about five o'clock shadow babies. We're talking about fur and the eyes are still closed. There's a very small window for that to be the case. And because that window is so small, it does intrigue me in thinking that something else is going on. There is a small window because there is a point where their eyes maybe haven't opened yet, but will be in a matter of days and they got their fur already. Um, but it is kind of one of those very particular points in their life where it's really hard to catch them at that point. So I'm a little suspicious about both having fur and eyes closed at the same time. So I ask, can you send me a photo? You should always ask for a photo, by the way. Even if you are certain by what they've told you, still ask for a photo because you'd be surprised at what you get sometimes. So on the left is what I got. So here's this poor little mouse in this container and here she is on arrival, very dehydrated. Her eyes are so sunken in, they're closed. Look at that poor thing. Her forehead is so sunken in. She's just, oh, you can see her skeletal structure um, from her shoulder up here and down her spine. Oh, she's in such bad shape, this poor thing. She was found in a basement. And look at her after one hydration session. Her eyes are starting to open. So you can see her here, they're still a little squinty, but she's already starting to fill out. You can see the top on her little forehead. She's already getting a little bit of volume. She's looking so much better. And that's just one hydration session. And later that day, you can see her here on the far right. She's perked up, she's exploring her enclosure. And she's looking right at me with, with her big mousy eyes. She's feeling so much better. Dehydration is very painful. Um, in this left photo, it's so severe. I mean, her body must have just ached so bad. All of her muscles hurt. Her head hurts. She must have had a slamming headache. Um, just in a lot of pain from um, not having access to water. All right, so here we have another example, and the tip on this one is your vet may not have seen this before, so keep that in mind. So the finder, I found a mouse that was walking funny. I think she might be injured, but she's really friendly and lets me hold her. Now, a lot of people are shocked at how friendly wild mice are. Um, you know, just like with humans, you know how sometimes you just get a good feeling about someone? Sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong, but we do get those feelings. We do get that connection to someone we don't really know, and we might trust them um, in a situation where we otherwise wouldn't. So, um, you know, animals have the exact same ability because we're all a part of the same kingdom, right? We all have that same um, judgment of character ability. People will argue that dogs have a better one than people do, but we all, we all have one. We all have a judge of character. And so this is really what the mouse is expressing here is um, she is in trouble and she knows it. And she knows it's beyond what she can do. And this person who's come across her, she got a good feeling about. And so 
she's letting this person um, hold her. You know, she's crawling on their hand. So mice, um, thinking about also their natural history, they have historically grown up around people, or at least the species that I'm uh, working with. So we're not talking about field mice or um, other mice that are in the world. There's a lot of different ones. Um, I, I pretty much work with the house mouse, um, which is the, the gray and white little fuzzballs that you find in barns um, and uh, you know in other places where people hang out a lot. So they have um, evolved to uh, live alongside us and while they stay elusive as much as they can, um, they really don't have a tremendous fear of us because they're always um, within a close proximity. Um, naturally speaking, they're, they stay close to civilizations. So it's, a, it's just a part of uh, a part of their survival. So um, having a mouse be friendly does, though, concern me that there is something wrong, right? So even though wild mice naturally tend to be uh, more friendly towards people, uh, a healthy mouse really wouldn't just walk up to somebody unless there was something really wrong. So this one sentence here, um, I think she might be injured, but she's really friendly. Um, absolutely, she probably is. There's something wrong. So I ask, is she walking in circles? So I want to know, you know, about that walking funny part, what do you mean by that? What makes her walk look odd to you? I need more details because I'm trying to rule out a few common reasons why she would be maybe walking in circles or not. So the finder says it kind of looks like she's limping a bit. So okay, I know we're not talking about a brain parasite. Pretty, pretty confident we're not talking about that. So it very genuinely could be an injury. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, a physical examination is needed now. So I will take a look at her. If I can't determine what's wrong, uh, she'll get x-rays um, and see if anything is broken. So here's what we found out. <laughs> so uh, the on arrival walking oddly. So when I inspected her, I found this mass by her little butt and you can see it in the photos. These first two, there's this really odd looking torpedo um, bulge. And then when I took her to my vet and I just said, you know, it's not in her butt. It looks like it's off to the side. I just didn't know what it was. And we were thinking maybe a tumor uh, because, you know, in the wild, they can get tumors. They can, you know, cancer exists in nature. So we did think about that. Uh, my vet, um, she, she does do wildlife, but because of that, she also will take care of if you have a pet rat or, you know, so she does domestics as well. So she does see tumors. And uh, she took x-rays, and uh, to her it looked like a benign tumor. It was just a, a mass of cells. But once I got home, it really kind of bugged me that you can see in that first photo, there is a hair covering it. It looks like she was licking it. So that kind of bugged me that I thought, gee, you know, a benign tumor, you're not bothered by it. Um, animals don't really bother the benign tumor because it doesn't itch. It doesn't do anything. And to see that she was actively uh, licking it made me think that maybe there was something else more to this. And when I looked closer, it looked like there was a little scab. And I just thought, oh no, I really hope this isn't a big infection, you know, or she got cut by something and all of this mass is just pus, you know. So I started to, to kind of gently with a little bit of olive oil because mice will groom themselves. And I want to make sure I use a material that she could lick off and be safe. My intention was to take a little olive oil and see if I could get the scab off so I could take a look at the wound underneath and it moved. And sure enough, I recognized it as a little head to a larvae and this was a bot fly. And here on the far right, you can see once I pulled it out of her, how big it is. And that's what it was. Um, she was such a good little patient. You can see her here. I got her eyes open. She has no reason to trust me, but she was so good. She let me hold her on her back like this in the tissue while I sat with tweezers waiting for this bug to stick its head out because I, I put a glob of olive oil on it so it couldn't breathe. And it poked its head out to bring it above the olive oil and I grabbed it with the tweezers and gently pulled. 
you want to pull slowly but at a consistent speed and that's because you want to stretch out the worm so it doesn't rip that hole bigger if that makes sense it made the hole big enough for its head but its body is is pretty truncated so when you're pulling you want to pull slow and at the same speed so it stretches the worm out and makes it as thin as possible to pass through the opening that it had already chewed open okay because we don't want to do more damage to her so I really after after the extraction um, I let my vet know what it was um, she didn't think an antibiotic was needed because it was really clean in there once the bug was out it collapsed on itself looked really clean I played it safe and kept her for another day just to make sure she was okay but she was ready to go and I released her